I always see it like a magic. Like you start with some raw ingredient, at the end you have magic. That the magic you have in your hand has nothing to do with what you started with. And even the, the dish itself looks different. Like if, if you put all that, and that that's to me is magic. I, I'm still getting excited every time a big pot is prepared. I'm like, oh God, this is so good. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Anna Husel, and I'm here with Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard. On today's show, Anna talks to Nassim Alakani, the owner of Sofre in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. Later on, I speak with Diane Kwan, the author of the new book Red Hot Kitchen, during a live interview at Books Are Magic. But Anna, tell me about Sofre. Sofre is an Iranian restaurant that opened in Prospect Heights in Brooklyn last June, so it's less than a year old. It's already gotten a rave review from Pete Wells in the New York Times. He gave it two stars. I really was crazy about the food when I went. But the wildest thing about Sofre is that when Nassim opened it last year, she was 59 years old and had absolutely no restaurant experience. 59 years old, first restaurant, two stars, lots of press. Wow, that's incredible. It must be the most amazing restaurant I've not been. What should I order? So we talk in our interview about this incredible fish dish, um, sort of on this bed of burnt herbs and tamarind that's really incredible. We talk a little bit about how it's made in our interview, but definitely order it if you go. I can't wait to visit. Here's Anna talking to Nassim Alakani. Welcome to the Taste Podcast, Nassim. Thank you so much for having me here. You are the owner of Sofra in Prospect Heights in Brooklyn and the personality behind the hospitality of Sofra. But you're also a very talented cook. How much of the cooking at the restaurant are you doing and how much is done by other people? Uh, I am doing a, a good portion of cooking. I have, of course, a whole team of prep in the morning. But I also have two very talented chefs who serve the line. I, uh, but I do most of the major stews. We essentially do a lot of stews and a lot of dips. I do still a lot of it, but all the final plating and the grilling of the kebabs and chicken and fish and all that is done by my chefs and the team during service time. So it's really a teamwork, but I do the foundation still every day. Back in the fall, you talked to a writer for a piece for Taste, actually, a piece that we published. And you talked about sort of the quiet hour or so before anyone else is in the kitchen. Yeah. And just that time when you're there totally alone, it's quiet, you're doing your own prep work. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about why that's important to you? Yeah, my but the quiet time has always been very important to me, regardless of what I did. It just allows me to structure myself, I just prep myself, whether I want to go for a long run or do a swim or conference. I just need that, or even cook for a day. I need to just reframe, like create a framework for me for that day and kind of shed everything outside of what I'm about to do and just mentally prep myself for that. Uh, Working in Sofre is even more crucial. That made it even more critical because it's a whole team coming and um, they come with not only, you know, their tasks to be done, but also I have to, I feel like I have to manage the the energy or the personality of the people. So it's just first I have to manage myself. So that's <laughs> that's the reason behind all that quiet time. And, you know, it's not a long one. Ten minutes, I close my eyes and think of the day and what's ahead, who's coming, what's to be done. We're talking right now on a Monday morning at 9.30. What time do you usually arrive at Sofra and what time does your team arrive? Um, I arrive at Sofra anywhere from 8.30 to 9, depending on a task. Uh, my team come around anywhere from 9.15 to 9.30, depending on who comes first. So, yeah, I usually give myself 10 minutes and uh, we start with, uh, of course, basic greetings. We start the big pots, things that take time. like, And then um, we sit down and meditate together, uh, light a candle, few short chat, meditation, 10 minutes, we have breakfast together, and we get to work. Oh, what do you have for breakfast? Does everyone take turns cooking? Um, I feel like uh, 
breakfast is not part of the restaurant setting. Usually in restaurants, everyone has one family meal around two or three o'clock, depending on the schedule of the restaurant. But when I come, I, have, I haven't had breakfast. I usually start very early. I swim and then I do my own thing. And by the time I get, I'm like starving. And by 9, 9.30. And in the beginning, I was just having some quick bites. And then I looked at my staff, like they're all working with me until about three. It's a long hours. And we don't get to eat, so let's at least have a breakfast. And that became a ritual. We we always have beautiful bread, and we have wonderful feta cheese, and some nuts, and yogurt, and fresh tomato, and whatever comes up. Sometimes eggs, and yeah, we have good breakfast always. Is that early morning routine with your prep staff part, is it at all a process of creativity or experimentation or do those parts of cooking usually happen later with your with your chefs? Uh, no, my prep team have a specific task. They really, they come in and sometimes even they have prepped the stuff for me the night before, not the night, in the afternoon before. And when we get to work, we just really get to work. It's lots of dishes to be made. The creativity comes when the chefs come. And we, you know, we always have an agenda to add a new dish or this and that, and then we work together when they, they arrive. This So Sofra is your first experience running a restaurant, and you're, a very, you're an experienced home cook, but was it a bit of a shock to go from making all of these dishes on sort of a small scale and getting to do it yourself oh, it to suddenly a- needing to scale it up like a million times? <laughs> Scaling up. Oh, first of all, it was a huge, huge shock. Uh, not because of a scaling up. I have done large size catering. I know how to scale up the things. What I didn't know, how to do it every day. It's a different thing that you get ready for a wedding of 300 people mm-hmm. than doing it like every day, 400 people. How to stack up, how to prep, how to keep things fresh, how to how to keep going. That was a huge eye opening, and and thank God I was so I would I was going to land on my face if it wasn't because of one of our uh, team member who joined us. I had no idea how capable he was. His name is Ali Sabur. He came from industry, fifteen years of uh, professional managing large scale kitchen. I don't know what I would be without him. So he yeah. just came and like really helped me to quickly get on track on what to do or not in terms of running a restaurant. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the difference between Iranian home cooking versus restaurant cooking and the kind of cooking you do at Sofra? Um, I haven't been to Iran for a year, but I visited Iran often when I was free, not so free. Uh, culinary scene in Iran has evolved so amazingly. I'm just so excited. I wish I wasn't so busy with Sofra. I could just go and eat everywhere. The The food has exploded in Iran. Um, but that's recent. It, we didn't have a tradition of restaurant. We had kebab houses and we had a street food um, and then we had home cooking. And these two were very different. We would go only to have kebab in certain places or have like special sandwiches. But at home, my mother was making these rice and stews. And that's typically was the case. This has changed because cities are big, people are working. So right now we have restaurant tradition. I haven't been there for the last year, so I can't say, but it was very, very exciting to see these new restaurants coming up doing traditional cuisine. So they were trying to do some home cooking in a restaurant setting. Um, What we are doing differently, and that's a little conscious, is um, they... The restaurants in Iran, because of maybe lack of exposure or lack of experience, they still do the similar home-style cooking, but in a restaurant scale. What we are doing, we take those traditional flavors that are amazing and familiar to people. We'd be doing this. We are doing traditional and, you know, historical. Some of the dishes I, I search for, there are some old. I go and dig out old recipes, talk to, like, people in the villages. I used to, and I have recorded their voices, but I don't try to present it the same way. I try to get those flavors, and that's what we are doing in Sofre. We get those really amazing, complex, uh, exciting flavor, but do it slightly differently, 
by just only treating certain elements of it. And those elements are mostly the protein usage. In Iran, it's a stew culture, slow cooking. Everything goes in one pot. We do that with most of it, but we take the fish out. We take the chicken out. We take Because we just have such a, especially now with like all that uh, organic, chicken we get them one of the best chicken in the in the country our lamb is the best lamb you can buy our fish it's like wild caught you know amazing fish so it's we try to treat those with respect those ingredients but at the same time keep the traditional sauces and just i think is a perfect marriage of uh, what I what I learned here in this country and the access I have to the in- ingredients and what I know from my background. Are there any proteins that you grew up eating or cooking that are hard to get in in Brooklyn? Uh, yeah, but I'm actually glad this is the case. When we were when I was young, uh, we had uh, pigeons and sparrow dishes, and it always gave me like a. Sparrows, I not know. a lot of meat. Huh? I know, no meat, it's just bone mostly. But it was just like, I, even as a child, I did not like any of these. But uh, no, yeah, I mean, there's so much protein. And I pref- I honestly think people should eat much, much less meat. I'm not vegetarian, but I'm really pushing. I myself eat meat occasionally, and I think it should be treated as such. So I'm excited to just, we have so much vegetables we can work with. Are there any ingredients that you've sort of come to as a home cook in New York that you've really gravitated towards and that have inspired you, like local produce here or just ingredients that are easier to get in New York? Um, Not like that. The climate I grew up is very different. I grew up in a desert. Perhaps if I was in California, it would have been the case. But Brooklyn, the climate is very different. And But I live around the corner of a Union Square uh, farmer's market. And uh, in the 80s and 90s, that was my highlight of my day, just mm-hmm. like when they were pop- when they were just few trucks. And now it's just everywhere. They are everywhere. And that's exciting. That's uh, just getting fresh, fresh stuff is wonderful for everyone who loves cooking. Yeah. Do you do shopping for Sofra at Union Square Green Market? No, no, we, I don't. First of all, the logistic and yeah. we, we are in Brooklyn. We can do farmer's market in Brooklyn, but uh, and we will. But when we started... We just had to just get our act together yeah, when you are established. Delivered. Yeah, we just had to survive uh, on a day-to-day ba- basis. So I didn't have the le- the luxury of a chef walking in a farmer's market mm-hmm. <laughs> and pick the best ingredients. But we do. We do lo- use a lot of local things when we can. Uh, we try to reach out to different markets, but we haven't had that. But we will. We, we, we get there. Aside from green markets, what are your favorite places to shop for food in New York? Just like pantry ingredients, spices, those sorts of things. Yeah, I always, people who know me, they, they know they can find me in Jackson Heights, Queens. Mm-hmm. It's a huge Indian community. And I can never have enough. Like I can just walk in that in those markets. I from the spices to the kind of like fresh fenugreek where I can find it only there. So I'm, I'm still shopping all my spices from a vendor I know. He, I buy a small batch because I want them the, to be fresh. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's incredible. Yeah, I still do that. So I always go. Um, even on my day off, I try to Wow. Grab so a once car. a week you try to go? No, to... no, no, no. Oh, okay. They, we get massive deliveries. But oh, okay. every opportunity I have, especially I know the seasonal rotation of some veggies. So I'll get myself in a car on Monday, try to at least quickly go and see what's new and what I can get. Did you know the Prospect Heights neighborhood very well before you opened Sofra? Or is there something that kind of drew you to that neighborhood? I, I I know Brooklyn very well. I have always been in love with Brooklyn from 80s, from its beauty to the diversity culture, to the sense of community culture. All my friends live in Brooklyn. My brother lives in Brooklyn, and I was a, his son's babysitter. So I walked, I walk around Brooklyn all the time and drive. The choice for Prospect Heights location came by chance. I was dropping off my neighborhood, my nephew at his daycare, and I saw the, the space availability, and I just it just called me. 
and I pursued that space for nearly a year and a half, two years until the current software location became available. And yeah, it, that was by chance. But also, I know Brooklyn. I was looking for a specific areas only in Brooklyn, like Carroll Garden or Prospect Heights or Park Slope. This is where, when I was looking for software site, th- these were my target, target areas. Have there been any surprises about the neighborhood or just about how the restaurant has been received kind of in that little community? Yeah, I didn't expect our neighbors would support us like they did. That was a huge surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps because they saw us for six years, like, dealing with construction issues and permit, I think they felt sorry for us. Or I don't know what happened, but the moment we opened the door, I didn't know many people. We were inside doing our you know, work, but when we just opened our door quietly, we didn't advertise, neighbors came in and they were all like next door neighbor or two doors away. And that support and that good word of mouth they put for us brought us where we are. And that was a huge shock. Uh, I, I mean, it just I'm so grateful to our neighbors. Yeah. And it really feels like a neighborhood restaurant, even though you've gotten a lot of critical acclaim. It still feels kind of like comfortable for the neighborhood. It is. And we, we keep, despite all that hype and, you know, fully booked stuff that we are, we set aside a few tables for neighbors. Yeah, they brought us here. So we, we owe them. And right now, we really know our neighbors. They come at the bar. They hang out. We know each other by first name. So it's wonderful. <laughs> One of my favorite dishes when I ate at Sofra, and I know Pete Wells wrote about this in his review for the New York Times as well, was the fish in tamarind herb sauce, Mm -hmm. um, which I know is sort of an adaptation of uh, galia mahi. Mm -hmm. What are the major differences between the version that you serve at Sofra and the original version of the dish? Uh, The sauce is exactly the same. It is so true. To, I'm so, um, I really made every effort that this particular dish, because I'm not from that region and I love the food of that region, it's south, it's southern cuisine. I always like a little bit of a spice in my food, and uh, but I grew up didn't have that. So when I found out these people put chili in their favor, I was like, that's exciting. It's our food plus a kick. So it was important for me that I don't mess up the recipe. This is a beloved recipe from South. To, to me, it's like almost sacred entities that, that you can't touch. I made sure if I'm doing it, I'm doing it right. I checked with my best friend who is from the local area, and she's a fabulous cook. Her mother is a fabulous cook, and many other women that I ate that fish. So this dish is the same. What is the process like to make the sauce? Because it's a little counterintuitive to, I think, American cooks to cook herbs into a sauce. We don't call it herbs. For us, they're vegetables. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to say that I didn't finish that the dish is exactly the same except the treatment of the fish. In Iran, they have this really thick, uh, meaty, large-sized fish similar to Chilean bass. And this uh, sauce typically is cooked, so they put the fish and the fish cooks in the sauce. We we take the fish out, crisp up the skin, and place it on top of the sauce. The process is, yeah, counterintuitive because of, A, it's really time-consuming. I use lots and lots of onion, but I cook them down. Then lots of garlic, I cook them down. And then all, all, all that layering of the spices and the turmeric and the chili. And then I remove all that vegetable, all that onion garlic mixture out of the pot. Then I put back all that so called, you call it herbs, but scallions, you know, parsley, cilantro, fenugreek, I'll put them back in the same pot saute them and make them kind of change the color. Then I mix them with the onions. Then I put the tamarind and let them cook slowly for another hour, hour and a half. So all that process, taking in, putting out, seems cumbersome. But once you get to it, it's really actually easy. You start the onion, you go and do something else, you come back, you add your garlic. And you come back, you go walk the dog, you put the vegetable. And, And it's just not... It It is, even for a restaurant setting, I start one pot as it's evolving, then I move to the next pot, do the same thing. So I'm like, not wasting any time. It's just different way of managing time. Um, yeah, and the outcome, the final outcome is almost always 
I always see it like a magic. Like you start with some raw ingredient. At the end, you have magic. That the magic you have in your hand has nothing to do with what you started with. And even the the dish itself looks different. Like if, if you put all that, and that that's to me is magic. I, I'm still getting excited every time a big pot is prepared. I'm like, oh God, this is so good. Yeah, it is. It's such a complex flavor. It's really hard to guess any of the individual ingredients. Exactly, in exactly. And I think, uh, yeah, that's what uh, Melissa Clark noticed. She, we were two weeks in opening. She tried that dish, and she came back a few days after, and she wanted the same dish, and and. Uh, it didn't register to me how interesting it is for the audience who never had it because for us, we eat this all the time. We just thought it's okay, it's another good dish, but it's a really good dish. <laughs> it is. What's next for you? Can you ever picture opening another restaurant or is there anything new that you want to try at Sofra that you haven't tried yet? Um, as far as what's new for me, I'm not 20 years old. I'm 59, <laughs> and I have embarked on a massive journey. So to me, it's like uh, giving birth to a child that needs full-time care, and uh, it needs time to grow. So for me personally, Sofre will be it in terms of adventure. And I really have dedicated, in my mind, uh, I'm giving five to six years of fully commitment, full commitment to Sofre. But I also have young, extremely talented and capable chefs who are excited about what we all do together as a team. And if they want to do something outside of Sofre or a sister Sofre restaurant or any of that ideas, I'm fully on board and supportive of the team activity. Uh, we don't have any specific agenda in mind. We are all committed to make Sofre strong. Uh, we are still trying new dishes every few weeks. So it's a, it's a lot on our plate. But, you know, it's always in the back of everyone. For me personally, after Sofre, if the time permits, book will be something I have always been excited to do, even before Sofre. So as soon as I have a little bit of headspace and actual time. Yeah, so Fred's book will be definitely next online. I can't wait. That will be very exciting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming on the Taste Podcast, Nassim. Nice Thank to you have so you. Thank you so much. No, it was a great opportunity. Thank you. Here's Matt with Diana Kwan at Books Are Magic in Brooklyn. Wow. So your book came out last Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> so so what? Have, how did you celebrate? Um, I went to a big uh, Chinese New Year, uh, or actually, yeah, a Chinese New Year dinner, like a Sichuan dinner at Han Dynasty with a bunch of friends. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it was fun. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Are you gonna go on the road? <laughs> I'm gonna do a couple cities and maybe add some more later. Uh, we'll be in. I'll be in uh, Boston in uh, March and yeah. San Francisco in April. Well, cool. Well, I wanted I, this book is really uh, fantastic. I, I I've had it for a while, and I, I got to say, the way that you break down all these fundamental Asian sauces, these chili sauces, is is kind of groundbreaking. I think I, I think it hasn't really been done in this way. And I guess my first question is, how do you, uh, as a as a recipe developer and writer, how do you switch between gochujan and xo and uh, yuzu kosho and like all these different cultures, which are not the same, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you have to like, like, do you do like one chapter for a month and then move on to sriracha after gochujang, or, or how did that work? I concentrated on like two, two or three at a time, and I didn't want to, um, you know, overload my fridge with too many hot sauces. So I did. I tested like. Um, you know, certain sauces until they were um, good enough for the book. And then I made the dishes with them and then just tested them over and over again. Okay. So. so the way the book is broken down is the first recipe is the fundamental recipe for the sauce. Yes. So the, what is XO? You break it down beautifully and then you cook with it. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I wanted people to be able to make their own at home so that they could um, customize the spiciness level, customize the flavors. Um, they could also just make huge batches at a time because some of the sauces are just like so addictive that you can easily use up a lot of them yeah. um, 
all at once. So I wanted to I wanted people to start with the sauce and then they can move on to like the appetizers, the entrees, desserts even. And I also I like that even if you aren't going to make the sauces, you can because you can buy most of these sauces. It's it really it's like an academic study of what goes into the sausage. Right? I mean, like how do you make gochujang? Explain. So there is actually two different ways. There is the, like the traditional way, which is um, involves like one to two months of fermentation, um, and you have to kind of just like tend to it, like you would tend to a. a plant and kind of um, open it, let in some air during the day, close it up at night. So that is just an exercise in patience. And then there's a much faster way, which you can do um, in just a short amount of time with um, a shortcut ingredient. Which is? Miso paste. Miso paste. Oh, so not using the meju, but using miso paste yeah. as, as, the, as the supplement. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nice. <laughs> I, I just think it's cool to like see like EXO, like explain that one. I think EXO we see on menus often. It's, it's you know it's it's kind of takes name from extra old like cognac right? yeah but then you make it it's a different it's a whole process right? mm-hmm. so I think exo sauce is probably the most underrated of all the ones in the book and not that many people will know about it um, but it's actually a sauce that comes from Hong Kong which is not a place that's known for having spicy cuisine it's all like Cantonese food and it's all much um, it's definitely not very spicy so. Um, around the 80s or 90s, restaurants started to make the sauce that they called like extra luxurious. And they would use um, dried scallops, dried shrimp, um, jinhua ham, um, and they would like blend it all and make it like this nice spicy sauce that you can put over like fish, you can put over vegetables, like it's just such a versatile in- um, ingredient. Um, but so many places in Hong Kong make their own versions that it really varies so much from place to place. Let's talk about sriracha. You write in the book how, like many, sriracha was your gateway. Mm -hmm. It was like your gateway drug. Yeah. (laughs) So so why is sriracha (laughs) such a gateway to all these other sauces and condiments we're talking about? I think it's probably like the most um, versatile and it goes with pretty much everything. Like you could put it on... um, Thai food, you could put on Vietnamese food, Chinese food, and then you could also put it on like pizza, you know? It's like a BuzzFeed article you just said there. It (laughs) goes on everything. Yep. Um, But you, you were, you were living, you were moved moved to China when you were 25, right? Yeah. So I was actually born there and it was born in the South, um, but I moved back to live in my twenties. I see. So that's when you you write in the book about your great awakening to these chili sauces, right? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. So yeah, I grew up eating mostly Cantonese food and I was not like a really big fan of spicy food until I moved to China. Um, And I was living in Beijing at the time. And Beijing, even though it's like, you know, over a thousand miles away from Sichuan province, like it is a a city that is obsessed with Sichuan food. So you walk down like any block and there will be like ton and ton of Sichuan restaurants. Um, So you can easily find like very, very spicy ones that are like very traditional Sichuan. And then you can also find like a toned down like Beijing style, but I ended up eating Sichuan food like almost every single day. And did you end up cooking then? Like, mm-hmm, is, yeah. like were you cooking as, as a twenty-five year old? Yeah, so I actually went to culinary school in, here in the city, and I studied like classical French cooking, and uh, I learned that before I even learned Chinese food. So I moved to um, Beijing, and I was like around twenty-five at the time, and I started. Um, I also, my parents lived in China and they were living in the South, so I visited them a lot and learned a bunch of Cantonese food. And then when I went back to Beijing, um, I ended up teaching at a cooking school um, that was run by Australians and they had a bunch of um, other teachers and we were teaching um, Chinese cooking to expats and travelers. What was that like? Wow. <laughs> what, 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 did they embrace the cuisine? The students? travelers, the yeah, definitely. It was a in a like a little um, hutong, so one of the uh, little neighborhoods that the government was trying to like all these um, were being torn down, and it was in this like nice little courtyard, very old style courtyard, and people would really like come here for a really like authentic experience. Oh, interesting. What so when you teach these expats to cook traditional like Sichuan spicy cooking, what what dishes are you starting with? Um, 
what did we start with? We st- how, how, like how do you how do you st- like? It seems like it would be a very difficult task. Yeah, so I think we mainly started with the dishes that a lot of people were familiar with, like Don Don noodles and Kung Pao chicken, and kind of moved on from there to like the more a little the ones that are a little bit harder to find, um, at least here in the U.S., like Chongqing chicken um, and like ants climbing on a tree. So all these different dishes um, and you. People sometimes, even if they've never tried Sichuan food before and they're afraid of spice, if they have it a few times, they become really, really addicted to it. Who in the audience has taken a class, uh, an Asian cooking class? Let me see. I'm curious. It's like probably like 20%. I feel like it's like the most underrated activity. It is like the most, inc- it like unlocks so much cool shit. Like when you <laughs> like learn how to actually cook um, Kung Pao chicken. Even. I'll steal that line from my classes. Please. Like, but the, you teach classes though, like mm-hmm. in New York, right? Yeah. How I teach them. Um, I teach them mainly now at the Brooklyn Brainery, which is in Prospect Heights. And then I do private classes too. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And and so are you seeing um, a little bit of a tilt towards Asian cuisine? Um, are, are people more interested in it in the past? Yeah, definitely a lot more than maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, it's like slight semantics, but it's condiments versus sauces. Because mm-hmm. in this book, there's like sambal. Mm-hmm. Like is sambal, that's like a condiment, right? Um, sambal olek is one of the only ones that you actually cook with too. Okay. So what I wanted to do was, um, put together a bunch of, um, sauces, uh, that you can cook with and can be used Which as a, is condiment. a condiment, right? Yeah. You're call it. We'll... Yeah. So like here in the West, we have this very strict definition of a sauce. Like you have the French mother sauces and then you have like Italian sauces and they're mostly like cooked into the food. Like you wouldn't have a lasagna and then have a separate squeeze bottle of tomato sauce on the side. But in Ch- in China and in Korea and other countries, like there there's a word called jang and that is an all-encompassing word that means something that you can cook with and can be used as a condiment and can be thick or thin and the same um, sauce can be cooked with um, and used as a finishing sauce. That's hard to explain. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. In, but you did such a nice job. With that, Thank so. you. Um, I want to talk about Yuzu Kosho because mm-hmm. I think that's one that I, I've actually, I've, I know about it. But I never really cooked with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, explain what it is and, and how do you cook with it? So Yuzu Kosho is also a little unusual because it comes from Japanese cuisine and Japanese cuisine is not really known for using um, chilies all that much. But it comes from um, this area um, called Kyushu, and they had they had done a lot of trading with Korea and Southeast Asia, um, and they use a lot of green chilies in the in these sauces. So um, they combine the green chilies with yuzu fruit, which is really hard to find here. But the flavor is kind of like a cross between um, a Meyer lemon and a lime with the heat. Yeah, with heat. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of just like pound everything into a mor- um, with a mortar and pestle, and then you make this sauce that goes well with um, a lot of noodle dishes and fish and vegetable yeah, dishes. Yeah, describe the flavor and what you would cook with yuzu kosho. So you can use it to garnish a lot of um, Japanese dishes, um, but I found that because it uses green chilies, it's also really good with um, Mexican food too. Shout out. Damn. <laughs> Tacos. Like enchiladas. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Because it's like, it has like this limey flavor. It has yeah. chili. So It's as acidity, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, whoa. And it's heat. It's definitely Mexican. <laughs> okay, I wrote you this. I don't know if you saw the questions in advance, but like, what is your hot take on MSG? Um, <laughs> so I think it is... It's hidden in so many things, and I think like we've probably all gone to restaurants where they use just like a tiny pinch, and we're probably like, "Oh my god, this is amazing! What is in here?" But I, c- I think I have a really sensitive palate to it. So if someone, um, if a restaurant overdoes it, I can just like feel it on my tongue for the rest of the day, even if I brush my teeth rigorously. So um, I don't love it if people use it that much diplomatic yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's i never use it but yeah so you don't cook with it it's not in your book no got it but you you recognize it as mm-hmm. okay yeah i recognize it as an important part of the culture i guess or the history industrial food yeah yeah i mean if you can avoid it you should avoid yeah. it. yeah maybe maybe i don't know <laughs> but it, i don't know if we can i have a shaker at home i use it once in a while <laughs> oh yeah I, yeah <laughs> over just anything uh you know usually in like a suit like anything with liquid mm-hmm. I, need, I need to like boost up the liquid if there's like a large amount of liquid oh, i'll like add cut it with salt like 50 50 
you know, mm -hmm. salt. I actually keep a jar of nutritional yeast on the side yeah. just for that purpose, just to add a tiny bit of flavor to something. Yeah, that's a good one too. I want to know uh, like three recipes from this book that like right away we will cook from when you open mm, it. I don't, I'm always trying to steer people towards the um, XO sauce. So if you make the sauce, you can make like um, garlic scallion noodles with it. And then you could also make a really um, quick flatbread pizza with it. Um, and also anything with like Sichuan chili oil. So let me ask you this for the exo sauce. If you're using the scallops, how long does it stay in the fridge? Okay. Like, um, there's a good amount of salt in it. So it's good for like up to a month. Oh, that's cool. And how, where do you find the dried scallops? Like you can find it in Chinatown. Chinatown. Um, a lot of, um, you can also go to these, like, uh, these herbal shops and you can find the really expensive ones. And then you can also find like the really inexpensive ones that are better for the sauce. Okay, cool. Or more affordable. Okay. What's your next project? I feel like there's got to be something <laughs> percolating right now. I have so many ideas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just need to nail down on one. Is that, be I mean, <laughs> like a hint. Like, do you want to write about, a re like you wrote the Chinese restaurant, their Chinese takeout yeah. cookbook, which is about a space and about mm -hmm. history, your family history. Mm -hmm. This is more of a reference, but it's also got a lot of stories in it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um, I would really like to do something elevating like Cantonese cuisine, which I think nice. pe a lot of people have like a really, like really skewed view of Cantonese cuisine in this country and it's kind of misunderstood. So let's talk, let's yeah. talk about that. Is it because that's what a lot of traditional Chinese, like in like the Midwest, there's like mm -hmm. a lot of where I'm from, not like take, talking shit about the Midwest, but it's like a lot of Cantonese food in the Midwest. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So Cantonese cuisine was like the first like Chinese, um, cuisine to arrive in the US and it was mostly cooked by people who had never really done much cooking like they were men who came here to work on the railroad and they kind of just like tried to um to recreate like what they remember from home but they didn't really have that much of a culinary background so they kind of just use like whatever um, they could find and yeah it was and then it started to develop into like the dishes that a lot of people knew back in the day like chow mein chop suey um, and a lot of it um, is very oily and people think it's like super super rustic and you have to use like super cheap ingredients um, but that's not the type of Cantonese food that you get in China or Hong Kong it needs to be like repositioned in the marketplace yeah definitely bit. what's a dish that you think you like could make you could change people's opinions about your Cantonese food with? Um, I would say one of the ones that comes immediately to mind is like lemon chicken. Like a lot of times we get it here and it's deep fried, but in China it's like kind of, um, it's very lightly stir fried um, or it's like velveted and it has this like really subtle lemon flavor. And it's delicious. You bring a velveting. It's a cool technique. Explain that. Velveting <laughs> is like, I've done it only a few times. I don't do it often, but it, it really is important. Yeah, you kind of just like um, you coat it with this like really thick um, cornstarch. Coat a protein like yeah, chicken yeah. or beef. Yeah, and it, you kind of like uh, cook with it so that it's just like very, very lightly done. And it's like kind of enveloped in this really nice texture. So it's not really done that well or that um, that much here in the yeah. U.S. But it, it creates this like very unique texture for a protein, mm -hmm. like, slightly slippery, but yeah. it's like really pleasing on mm -hmm. the palate. Yeah, yeah. In Cantonese, they call it wat, which is like, oh, yeah? which is like, I mean, it roughly translates into slippery, but oh, cool. it doesn't really sound that good to the English ears. <laughs> but you've had like, everyone's had it. You've gone to like a really dope Chinese, like Cantonese restaurant. You're mm -hmm. gonna have some velveting. Yeah, there. and you're like, what is this? Yeah, texture why is it velvet? like? Yeah. What about, okay, I want to ask you about like a restaurant concept with these sauces. Because I feel like you could have a, you could have a really fun time introducing like sambal and gochujang mm -hmm. and, uh, and what else? Like XO to the masses. You could. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I don't know if I'm cut out for the restaurant life, but I I'll mean do, you. <laughs> do pop up dinners. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I just, I don't know. Maybe it, it seems like it'd be a cool idea. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for Appreciate having it. me. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis. Studio recordings by Pat Stango. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>